I'm going to be talking about uh, today, Revelation chapter 3, the second to the last church. This is the Philadelphia, the church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Now, these guys I love. You'll notice that the guy I wanted, that's Kurt Neely, Pastor Kurt. I put him up there because he's so loved. And the neat thing about him, a lot of people... Uh, joke around about when he preaches sometimes he he gets very tearful but you know what people that have intimacy with god cry easy okay real men cry trust me the guy at the top left is somebody that we all loved here his name is al gregory al gregory was my friend he was joe's friend he was you know he chose his friends very very carefully but the ones that he loved, he would die for. The ones that he loved, he would die for. The bottom left, that's Corby when he was a child. <laughs> I had to throw that up there. Dude. <laughs> You're not the only one that, <laughs> that says, why does he do what he does sometimes? I don't know why I do what I do sometimes. I want to talk to you about the Church of Philadelphia. Now, as we've walked through these, I've tried to identify all seven churches, and I will identify all seven churches. But if you start from the beginning, remember, Ephesus is maiden of choice. Smyrna, the next church, means myrrh, okay? And myrrh had to be what? Crushed in order for any type of um, smell, the aroma, to come out of it. Otherwise, it's just like smelling a rock. And I'm not kidding. I have some, and you can smell it. It smells like a rock until you start to crush it. And then it's like, wow, this is powerful. And so the love that the first ones had when they were told to go out and preach the gospel, after a while, it started to fade. And so as they started to fade, the Lord tried to bring them back, the church. And in order to bring them back, then he had to do what he has done to a lot of people in these first couple rows here. He had to start crushing them. He had to start doing something in your life to try to bring you back. You guys are meant for something big, not small, big. And I'm serious. You'll either find it or you don't. But if you do, your world will absolutely turn hardcore on you, and you'll rock for Jesus. Guaranteed. But you must get it now. The next church that comes in after that is Pergamos. Pergamos means mixed marriage. And in this mixed marriage, that's where, and I told you a little bit, that in 312, Constantine comes in and he says, let's just make everything legal because we're tired of people dying from their Christianity. If you were a Christian, you were killed. They went through 10 kings all the way up to Nero and he absolutely destroyed. There were roads on, on the Romans road. There were roads, literally, that had crucifixions all down the road. You could walk down and you could see on both sides of the road people hanging on crosses. That's how bad it was. It's horrible. So Pergamus comes up and they mixed marriage everything so we could be comfortable. We want to be comfortable. The church wants to be comfortable. I don't want to be the one that's always having to preach Jesus to somebody. And so I'm just going to relax. People get mad when you start getting up in their face about their morals or whether or not they're acting like Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. She's so beautiful. You know, <laughs> I look at these beautiful brand new little babies that are out there and I wonder the world that they're going to be in. In another 12 years, I just read, in another 12 years, they're going to have cars that are all self-driven, 
and they don't even have wheels on them. Yeah, they're set off the ground. They all set off the ground. There must be something along the roads that it keeps it on. I don't, I don't know. I don't even know how it works, but they're talking about it now. The world that she lives in is so different than what we lived in. I look at it now. The world is so changing. The church has become so comfortable. We are no longer fighting a fight, you guys. I just want to make that, as far as the ones that are fighting a fight, I encourage you to continue to fight. But very few are actually in the battle. Very few. So this Pergamus church that got mixed marriage in it decided that they just wanted to be comfortable. So Thyatira means continual sacrifice. And continual sacrifice means that they were very legalistic. Now that we are comfortable, now I'm settled. I know what I know, and nobody's going to teach me different. Whatever culture you're in, you just go for the culture. You don't go for truth. You just go for the culture. If you're raised over in Iraq, you're going to be Muslim. Well, which one's right? Is it Muslim or is it Christianity? Or is it Mormonism? Is it Catholicism? Is it, I can go all over the place with this. Which one is it? You're responsible for your spirituality. You must know what you believe and why you believe it. That is your job. After that, Smyrna kicks in. Smyrna is remnant. And so out of that legalistic church comes this remnant. This remnant, it says it. Most of you have had your garments defiled. But it says some of you have not. Some of you are still maintaining your walk with God. And the righteousness is still in you. Some of you. I hope that's a lot of people in this church. I don't know. My cousin graduated a ranch a while back. I try to pray for him and pray for him because I know, Ryan, that the stress and the pressures on your life are going to be immense. And I need for you to understand that God really does love you and he cares for you and he's going to make that road straight, but he knows your heart in it. Walk as though he's right beside you all the time. Walk that way. So this remnant comes up and now this remnant that is there has to make a choice. And I believe that most people in America have made their choice. I don't really like their choice. When you find out in California alone, 65% of the people that voted out there, I can't imagine that 65% wanted abortion at birth. Not before, not, a, not two days into when they consummated. We're talking about when you see the baby the baby is born. You're telling me almost 65% of California voted to kill him? And some people say, well, man, there's something wrong with that. Or, or maybe they did, and maybe the church is total, totally irrelevant today. It's not making any difference. I like Jack Hibbs. Jack Hibbs, Chino Hills. Calvary. He's not afraid to tell anybody. He's got a big church, but he'll, he'll flat out right say the church in California is totally irrelevant today. They can't make a difference. They won't make a difference. They won't stand up and they won't be salt and light to the world. We are no longer salt and light to the world. And we're going to have to make a decision whether or not we're going to become a Philadelphia church or we're going to become the church of Laodicea. Now, I believe in America, this church is Laodicea. 
Now, I believe that there's still a remnant and there's always a thread that God is working in. But for the most part, I believe that the church in America is ran by men and not the Holy Spirit. It's ran by boards. It's run by organizations. It's run by, you name it, even by money. If they tithe big, then they got a big say-so. If they don't tithe at all, we can afford to lose them. That's, where do we get these ideas? The Church of Philadelphia, let's walk through. Remember, the first thing that is addressed in all seven churches, the very first thing says, I know your works. You can't fool God. You can't fool him. You can always go before God and say, now remember, they tried. Lord, you remember when I... Lord, you remember when I... We do it all the time. But one day when we meet him, Lord, you remember when I did this? I went to church here. Remember when I led a youth group? Remember when I went over here and over here? Can you imagine what the Lord is thinking when he looks at you and goes, no. No, actually... I've never known you. Do you think that'll hurt? And you'll go, well, remember, we were over at the altar, and I was, I was up in the front row. I was worshiping up there. Hmm. Yeah, but I never knew you. I never had any intimacy with you. Oh, you, you might have done some, some things, but to make you feel better. But when's the last time you done something to make him feel better? That's different. That's different. What you do for the Lord is different than what you did for you. So the Philadelphia church comes in. He says, I know your works. And then he says, but I've set before you an open door. An open door. We're going to find out how important that is that you have an open door. That door being one person, his name is Jesus. So here's this church that means brotherly love. And he says, I've opened a door for you. You're going to love this. No man can shut this. Okay? Now, if somebody opens the door for you, then who probably did the knocking? Hold on. To a Laodicean church, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. And that's to a Laodicean church. But here he says, but I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it for thou hast little strength. I believe that he tells us, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. If you seek, you're going to find. If you ask, I would love to give it to you. It's only to a Laodicean church that we find that he's on the outside of the church, knocking, still trying to get in. With this church, we knock. You need to be busy in ministry. You need to find what God would have for you. Don't let anybody stop you from doing what the Lord is telling you to do. Go through that door. It says you've had a little strength. Now, how many in here have been so busy in ministry and the world has come against you so hard that you just have very little strength? You're tired. You're like, oh, I've been doing so much. Now, I can tell you if you're in the other uh, underground church in China, you're probably going to experience a little bit of this in America. <laughs> I don't even need to say anything. It says you've had, you got very little strength left. That means you have been in the fight. Do you know? Can you pick a group of people in this church? Just right here in this fellowship, I should say, that you would say, I want them in my spiritual foxhole. I want them in my fight. If there's a war 
then do I want Mr. Pitkin in my foxhole? Do I want AJ in my foxhole? Do I want Darren in my foxhole? Who is actually, who do I trust as a man of honor and a man of God that I will have in my foxhole fighting for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ that won't get us all killed? It says here, you've kept the word, and then he think you have not denied my name. Well, that means that evidently there has been pressure to deny his name. The pressure has been on this church, and yet they're still in love with God, and they still love people enough to where when somebody says, you will not preach the gospel, what did the disciples go out and do? They preached the gospel. We're going to set you free, but when you go out there, the last thing I want you to do is to preach the gospel. Stop preaching the gospel. As soon as they left the jail, what did they do? They preached the gospel. Everybody said, oh, you got to, you have to obey the law. Isn't that what the scripture says? Now, when it goes against God, God said, do this. The law said, do this. I disobey the law to obey Christ. I'm to be salt and light. So when somebody says, I don't want you to be salt and light anymore, when the government says, I don't want you to be salt and light anymore, then guess what? Doesn't make a difference. I'm going to be salt and light. You see, the church has lost its salt and it's lost its light. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? The Lord's coming back soon. And man, I don't want you to get hurt through that. He says, behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they're Jews. In other words, they're a part, they say that they're a part of the elect, but he says, they are not. In fact, they are lying to you. They're not a part of the elect. They've lied. You know how many people thought that other people were Christians and they got close to them and they finally recognized that they weren't even close. We as, we, as Christians, we either need to be or not be. Because otherwise, if you don't get this, then the Laodicean church, it says you weren't hot and you weren't cold. If you were cold, at least you know what you needed. If you were hot, at least you'd be doing something. But you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, check it out. I will spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to get rid of you. Now, to spew you out of his mouth is a term that literally means it's making me sick. Now, it's one thing when the Lord says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But can you imagine what he would say, Mr. Pitkin, if he says, actually, you make me sick. I know what you'd do. I know your heart. You would hit the ground and just weep, knowing that I'm not worthy of God. I'm sorry, Lord. I am so sorry. But you know what? Time for being sorry? Think about it. When are you going to say it? Because today is the day of salvation. And in order to have salvation, you must repent. Listen, as we go on, it says, I'll make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Well, he's not talking uh, to people to have them come and to worship you. <laughs> it said they're worshiping at your feet. Give me a break. We're not even allowed to let that happen. So what does it mean? They're only worshiping at your feet is then because you are sitting beside who? And it's making reference all the way through this to who the Philadelphia church is. I believe it is the bride of Christ. So I'm going to make them to come. They, they're lying about who they are. But I'm going to have those people come and they're going to be worshiping at your feet. Why? Because you're sitting right beside me. And they're going to worship at your feet, and I'm going to let them know that I loved you. Well, don't you love them too, Lord? 
I mean, that would be my question. I'm going to let them know that I have loved thee. Well, what about them? Don't you love them? See the difference. It said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The bottom line is, is they did not love God. They said they did, but they didn't. Everything was religious, 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 religious. Forget religious stuff. It doesn't have to be that way. It could be personal. It could be intimate with God. It says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Now, this is one of the only times in Scripture that it actually tells a church, a type of church. The hour of temptation, interpreted, means great tribulation. So he said, I'm going to keep you from this great tribulation. This is where some people, because of this Scripture, rather than being pre-trib, a lot of people are mid-trib because they said this keeps them from great tribulation. Didn't say from any tribulation. <laughs> My wife goes, amen, about time you listen to me. <laughs> Cindy and I pretty much line up on everything. We don't, we're, we don't even differ. We don't, we don't argue about these things, that's for sure. But I will tell you what, I don't really want to go through it either. Because you love me, because you've kept the word, because you've not denied my name, I'm going to save you from what I'm going to do to a lot of other people. Yes, you should be somewhat worried about it if you're not living for Jesus. In fact, if you're not living for Jesus, I would really be worried about it. <laughs> okay? Okay? I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Um, for those that don't know, for those that dwell upon the earth, he's talking to a group of people whose citizenship is on the earth. Okay, they're, they're called earth dwellers or those that have their citizenship on earth. Guess what? My citizenship is in heaven. So what it's saying that if you have not changed your citizenship by being born again, and it says it's going to happen to all the rest of the world, right here, okay? Though all the other ones that dwell on the earth are going to get it. If you want to escape it, then there's only certain things that you can do. And look at them and find out what they have done. They have been absolutely faithful and true. They have not denied Christ even in the midst of, of turmoil, temptations, and trials. And if you don't do this, we're going to put you in prison. If you don't do this, we're going to kill you. If you don't do this, and they've stood strong. I'm not going anywhere. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. You do what you want. We used to, I used to literally teach my kids that if that day came, that I would have to look at my children and they would have to look at me if they said, with a guillotine right there, your dad is going to lose his head if you do not deny Christ as your Lord and Savior. My children would go, you know what? My dad talked to us about this. Dad's ready to go. And I believe that my family would look at me and say, Dad, I love you. I'll see you in a minute. And if it's any of my children... I'm going to say, son, I'm going to die fighting for you. So I will see you in a minute. Because <laughs> if you're going to kill my son, you're going to have to go through me to do it. <laughs> because I'm his protector. And I am my family's protector. So if anybody's going to die, it's going to be me first. Now, you know that five out of seven churches had something about them that the Lord didn't like. Now, everybody likes to claim that, you know what? When somebody is saved, there's nothing they can do to hurt that relationship after that because they're just saved. I say you're wrong. Five out of seven churches. If God looks at you, he's supposed to see you through Jesus Christ as spotless, and yet 
five out of seven churches. He does not see two of them. He finds no fault. There you go. Yes. But five of them, he says, but this thing I have against thee, I see it. And I know you work, so you can't fool me. You'll never fool God. He's in everything. He sees everything. He even knows your thoughts. He knows the intentions even of your heart, it says in Hebrews. But here, there's nothing bad. Got nothing bad for you. You guys rock. Wouldn't that just be, as a church, wouldn't that be so cool if all of us were just standing out? Here we are at the altar, and the Lord looks at everybody and goes, altar folks, raise your hand if you're from the altar. We all raise our hand from the altar. Okay. Open up those gates. I want these guys in. I would just go, yes! Wouldn't that be cool? I'd be jumping for joy to watch you walk through that, walk through that gate. Praise the Lord. So now what to do? He says, behold, I come quickly. Three words that he uses in three other passages and I want you to understand where he uses that, which I'm going to go over in a minute. Whenever he says that to a group of people, it's nothing negative at all. It's nothing but positive. I come quickly. I want you to hold on to that that you got. And this is in America what it, I think a lot of people have given up. He says, don't let anybody take your crown. Let no man take your crown. Well, what's your crown? It's either a crown of righteousness or a crown of life, but either one of those crowns that are used are still things that you have done for the Lord, that you're going to take the crown and put all those works at the feet of Jesus and say, I want to thank you, Lord, for giving me the will, for giving me the want, for giving me the discipline, for giving me the, here, it's all, it's all yours. Thank you very much. But he says here, don't ever let a man take your crown. No human being. And I can tell you, I've had pastors try to take my crown. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean, Pastor Tim? I've had people tell me, stop doing what you do, and you don't need to do all of that. I mean, it's kind of legalistic. You don't need to be doing all them, the works. The Lord will bring them to you. The Bible says to go and preach the gospel. It didn't say sit there and let them all run to you. But Pastor Tim, that has nothing to do with your salvation. Listen, I'm not making it a salvation issue. Here's what I'm doing. I'm saying that I love Jesus. I want to be obedient. I'm doing it because he called me to do it. If you're not doing it, why do you have to slam me for doing it? Do you understand Cain did the same thing with Abel? Abel, he made a sacrifice that the Lord was pleased with. Cain knew that God was more pleased with Abel's. So what did he do? He killed, he killed him. I mean, what? That's horrible. Can you imagine Adam and Eve at the time? We're just starting out. God created man and woman to have children, and you killed your brother. Didn't start out very good, did it? Once sin enters in, sin always leads to death. And he killed him. Why? You're making me look bad. Stop it. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you wonder, when have they experienced death? I mean, it's not as if they listen to the news. I mean, it's, you know, if Cain and Abel somehow were in Compton, California, I'd get it. But their land, I mean, Adam and Eve, Adam walked in the cool of the day with God. Eve came along, it was precious. Now he's got this precious gift. Lord, so I'm going to give you somebody to help you. Fine help you are. You go off and grab something out of the tree. Lord, it's the woman you gave me. You told me she was going to help me. 
Some of you have experienced that. <laughs> she didn't help that much. And then you bear children. Teach your children. Raise them up in the way that they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. <laughs> he killed him. Not a very good example for the first try. You guys, without our love for Jesus, you will fail. That's all there is to it. You're going to fail if you're not intimate with the Lord. You're going to fail. And here it says, don't let anybody tell you not to do what God's telling you to do. Don't let anybody tell you to stop the works of the Lord. I've had people, I've had tons of people, not just one. I'm talking, I could, I could count and count and count of people that have said, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You're legalistic. You're legalistic. You need to stop preaching works all the time. That's funny. All seven churches, the very first thing that he mentions, works. You see, I'm not preaching works. Salvation is a free gift that is given to you by Jesus Christ. But when you're saved, you've got to do what he tells you to do. Otherwise, you're in trouble. And that's what it says. That's what it says. Now, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7. Let's talk about these three words, I come quickly. Okay? Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saints of the prophecy of this book. Now, that's a great thing. Behold, look out, here I come. And if you want to be blessed, just know this. All you have to do, keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Just do it. Wait, did you understand what he just said? Do it. Keep it. Hold fast to it. Remember, do it. If you're not doing it, I doubt that you have it. Okay? He says, do it. Keep it. He goes on to the next one, 22 and 12. Again, this is the last chapter. He's closing the whole book with this. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his works shall be. What did you do for me? He'll approach Tatiana and say, Tatiana, what did you do for me? Tatiana is going to go, well, Lord, you know what? I spent a lot of my life, and I was doing it for me. And there's a lot of my life I was just, it was just more of a religious thing. I know that I had to do it, and so I did it, but I didn't really get it. And then, but Lord, then I got you into my life. And then the reason why I started doing it was different. It's because I love you. And once Tatiana fell in love with Jesus, then the things that she were doing, that she was doing for the Lord, started to put those little marks on her crown and the rubies and the gems and the don't let anybody take that from you. Keep doing what you're doing if it's for the Lord. And don't let anybody stop you. Because why? He's going to come quickly for these people. Quickly. I like that. In the twinkling of an eye. But three times where it says, I'm, I come quickly, it's to this group of people. He which testifies these things, saying, surely I come quickly, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. So three times it uses that, three times saying, I'm going to come really quick. And when I do, I'm coming for the people, basically, that have kept the words of this prophecy, that have kept obedience before God. Now, there is a reward. The reward is a bride ship. To them that overcome, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from God. The New Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 19 is what? The New Jerusalem is the bride. That's the bride of Christ. And then he says something that's very different in this than any other time he says it. Here he says, and I will write upon him my, 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 my new name. Now let's test the difference in this really quick. Let's find out what he's referring to. 
Isaiah 62 and 2, he's speaking um, to Israel about the Gentiles. He said, The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Revelation 2, 17. We already, this is in one church. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the churches, to them that overcome. I will give to the eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that received it. But in 312, in 312, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, he shall no more go out. Or ride upon in the name of my God, in the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, uh, from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. When I got married to Cindy, <clears throat> she took on whose name? This is an intimate statement. He said the same thing in John chapter 14. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But he says, I go to prepare a place for you. That when I come, and listen to this carefully because it's an intimate statement. It's something that a, a, a bridegroom would say to his bride. Okay? There goes my head for a minute. I'll get it back in a second. I did not go to bed last night. I don't know. I did not. I'm still awake from yesterday. Didn't sleep. Nothing last night. Don't know why. Saturdays, I'm always under so much attack all the time. Saturday night. So pray for me on Saturday night. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you that when I come, I will receive you unto myself. You come to my chamber. What? See, all these people have gone, and all these people have mansions, but we're not. He's talking to a group of people that don't care about the mansions. In my father's house, there's many mansions. I, if, that, if that wasn't true, I would have told you. But don't care much about that. See, what I really care about is when I come, when I come, I'm going to receive you unto myself. That's intimate. That's very intimate. And that is what he's saying to this church. And it's important that we get it. John 10, 1, verily, verily, I say to you, he that entereth not by the door to the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. You're a thief and you're a robber. In other words, you're not going to do it. You're a crook. Try to get up another way. You're a hypocrite, and you're a crook. You lead other people to get up there any other way than Jesus be in the door. You're a crook. John 10, 2. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse 7, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So when he tells the Philadelphia church, that he is opening a door for them that no man will shut. He's saying, as the shepherd, I'm going to open the door for the sheep. But were you really sheep? And then in verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Danny preached it a while back. You know, we talk about heaven, uh, or he says it on his new website. We talk about heaven a lot, and heaven being streets of gold. Well, that's the new Jerusalem. Here, it says, even if you enter in, there's going to be pasture. It's just, like, it's just like being home out in Blue Creek again. There's a new heaven and a new earth. In Revelation 4.1, he now experiences something. After... Same author as in John. He's in Revelation, same one. And here, after he tells the Philadelphia church, okay, that I'm going to leave this door open for you, listen to what happened as soon as John got this revelation. Now, he got a revelation of what was, what is, 
and what is to come. Three different parts. He walked out what was in chapter 1. He walked out what is at the time that John was living in chapter 2 and chapter 3 with the seven churches of Asia. And then chapter 4 and on is that which is to come. And chapter 4, right off the bat, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it was a trumpet talking with me. Well, we already know who that is. That's all through the Old Testament. God himself is on the other side of that door. But who's the door? Jesus. There was a door that was open. The only way that you could get there and on the other side of it, now here's the trumpet. And what did it say? Come up hither. He experienced, I'm going to show you things that are going to happen. He experienced what you and I are going to experience when I talk about the rapture. He experienced it. The church was running out of strength because it was standing so long for what they believed. Their love for God and their love for the church kept them going. Some people just do it for themselves, but not the Philadelphia church because of its brotherly love. If I was told not to go preach the gospel, you're not going to stop me. If they tell us to close the church when there's no reason to close the church, then we're staying open. That's all there is to it. Psalm 38 and 10. Now, I've always had little problems with David because I don't understand. Boy, God was, God really took it easy on David compared to, okay, that was a bad thing. He knew that Bathsheba's husband was going to die when he sent him to the front lines. Listen to what it says. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me as for the light of mine eyes that also is gone from me. He was at his last. He was done. I know what it is to be done. I know what it is just to want to go home. I do know what that is now. I didn't know before. Six and a half years ago, I figured it out. When you don't have the strength to move a finger, you figure out that you got nothing without God. Nothing. One little stroke where you can't move anything. And you're just praying, Lord, I, man, I really need you right now. You see, he is the only life that you have. There is no life outside of him. You need to, you need to grasp that. Now listen to this. Psalm 39 and 13, oh, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. He was making a plea. Listen, I'm going to be gone soon. I'm going to die. But you know what? I need some strength in my bones to go out on. I'm not going to go out crossing the finish line. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe I, I may, but I don't want to do that, okay? I want to finish running through that line six inches in front of Pastor Kurt. <laughs> he doesn't think I can do it, but I've still got some know what it is but I got something in my leg David knew that he was losing all of his strength and he asked God give me strength to finish this the way I really need to finish it I want to finish this race well I want to go through this the way that I need to go through it can a man take your crown it's a badge of royalty it's a prize it's a symbol of honor you are to be honored for what you have done for the Lord. That's the way that the Lord is going to honor you. Okay? He says that when he comes, he has his crown with him. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them also, that what? Why doesn't it say all of those that were obedient? You notice when he's mentioned these kinds of things, he always is relating to something 
I come quickly, I come quickly, I come quickly. Here, he uses other verbiage, meaning the same thing. His appearing. I want you to love my appearing. Look forward to my appearing. What's he really getting at? If you haven't seen somebody in a long time and you love them dearly, how often do you go, I just want to see them. I want to see them. I, I want to see them. Or you had somebody that you love so much that went home to be with the Lord. I want to see them. Can't wait to see my dad again. To hug him. That's what the Lord is saying to us. Why is it that you can't look forward to my appearing? You always talk about going and seeing your dad, going and seeing your mom, going and seeing this, going and seeing that. What about me? I'm the one that died for you so you could get there. What about me? And that is what he's saying. All of those that love his appearing. James, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he'll receive crown of life not until you're tried when you're tried why well because we don't even know that you have the faith until you're tried with it no matter what happens to me I will always stand I can't, I can't do it anymore a week ago you were bold you were strong this morning you're crying like a baby and you want to quit why you see that crown of life, it says it's promised to the ones that love him, that truly love him. If you love him, you'll make it. How do we know? Because you love his appearing. Let's do the same thing. If you have a child, you haven't seen him in a long time, and the only way that you're going to see him is you've got to make it across a border that's illegal to cross. You say, I have faith that God will get me there. But you're a Christian, Darlene. You can't go. They will arrest you. They will put you in prison. Your child's on the other side. But see, you long to see your child. And so what are you willing to do? You're willing to put that faith to works. I'm going to see my boy. But you may get arrested. I'm going to see my boy. And then Rick goes, well, I'm going with you then. We're both going to go. You see, there comes a time where you can have all the faith in the world. But when you're tried with it, then, then it becomes yours. Okay? Then it becomes yours. Which the Lord hath promised only to them. And I say only because it says here to them that love him. The promise is to them that love him. You understand how easy this really is? You don't have to do all of that other stuff. That's why it says that you're no longer under that, the, the law of the works. Now the law is in the heart. And now in the heart you're going, I just, I just really love you. It's not a problem. Do many of you have a problem in here going, oh, crud, I'm trying to cut down on killing people. Today, maybe one or two. But I'm cutting down. No, you don't, do you? You don't. Righteous acts can be taken from you every day by well meaning people, by Christian people. I've had a lot of Christians trying to stop some of the things that we do because it's not by works, not by works, not by works, not by works. Listen. When you start doing works, then you tell me it's not by my works. How's that? Well, I don't believe it's works. Good. I'll tell you what. If you have faith, I will know you because you're doing the works. Period. Okay? And then the Cain and Abel story. I already went that. Now, the New Jerusalem, you'll understand what Danny was talking about a while back. The New Jerusalem is the city that's four square and gold, and when it shows up, you'll find out there's still a heaven and there's still an earth. It never actually says that it even touches the earth, but it's there. The 12 gates 
that are around it. They're fashioned out of one pearl. Check that out. About 1,386 miles of fashioned of one pearl. Okay? 1,386 miles this way, this way, this way. That's from here a little more than halfway across the United States. And the same up, in, out. These gates open up at the very end in this new Jerusalem. And it says that there is no need of the sun. So understand that there's no sun hanging out here. Why is there no need of the sun? Because it says God and the Lamb are the light thereof. When those gates open up, it lights the world. It lights the world. You say, well, what does the inside look like? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the outside, outside of exactly what Scripture says. But I know it's huge. Yesterday, I spent so much time just trying to come up with a picture that was in my head. That's all. I'm going to show it to you. I tried to build this thing, this picture, of everything inside being gold. I was going to put a bunch of emeralds and, and all the, the different things that the Bible mentions, but that, a lot of it's just on the foundation part of that. But I was going to put crystals. and But you know what? When it comes down to it, I don't want to take away from what God really wants when we get in the New Jerusalem. When we make the New Jerusalem. You see, what's important right here you see the lady that's at the top? I put her in there, just fading. When she was younger, maybe she aborted two babies. When she gets there, she has something in her mind that she really wants. Of course she's going to see God. Of course all of that is there. But the love that God gives you once you're saved also gives you a yearning to go after something when you get to heaven. And she now is just looking at those two little babies. Just longing now to touch them, to be with them, to hold them. Because God changed her heart. You'll see my family is in the background in front of the kid with the ducks there. My family's in the background. There's six of them there and they're all walking towards the end of that road where Christ is. And there's a bunch of people at the end of the road. There's a little cross down there and a little city of people worshiping. And I'm heading there. Because why? Because I want you to know the importance that when I am in the New Jerusalem as the bride of Christ, part of the thing to be getting there is I want my family there and I want to be with them there's a lone little kid playing in the street maybe his parents didn't make it but you see what the Lord is doing with him he is having a great time out there just playing with the ducks on the left in the bottom you'll find people dancing I hope there's dancing in heaven. I really do. I hope there's dancing in heaven. Not disco. <laughs> I'm not talking disco, but, you know, good ballroom dancing type things. That'd be cool. So there they are. There they are. And they are in love. Because I believe that even married people, when you make it to heaven, I believe that you are one. Rabbinical writings say that you can't even make it to heaven without the other one because the two of you are one. Now, I won't get into that today, but it's so important that when you get there, you and your bride or your husband make it together. And you can see that Jesus is checking them out, and he absolutely loves the love itself. He loves to watch people in love. He likes to watch people ministering to other people, helping other people, praying for other people. It's all about that. You see, 
this city is going to be absolutely unreal. But all of your imaginations, you will see the ones that have died, that have longed for God. You will get to dance with the ones. You're not going to sit there and just stare at Jesus for eternity. There's a new heaven and a new earth. And the love that you have for God and the love that you had for people made you worthy according to the standards of God and according to his salvation by his spirit to be able to go and enjoy way beyond your imaginations. On the way to Turkey, coming into the harbor, that's us coming into the harbor. We're getting ready to go to watch the look at the seven churches. You'll see that the guy in the upper right, that's me. Again, I place these little pictures in here. Don't know why. I just really enjoy doing it. Okay? That's me when I was a kid. I was not living right. After that, I got saved. My longing at that particular time, I liked fast cars and girls. Now, My cars are broke down. I really like Jesus. I love Jesus. That's the temple area that is there. Going through this, I have a bunch of pictures. We don't need to go through all of that. That's Cindy and I down on the left down there getting our start in life. That's where the chariots, and there's, there's grooves in the road where the chariots actually went. And then, of course, my end one. It's the one we started with. Folks, let me remind you of something. We're going to take communion. If I could have, uh, because we're running out of time here, if I could have elders and deacons come forward. They're going to serve you this morning. It's so important that you understand why we do what we're doing. We do it because we want to remember what the Lord did. That's it. If I was on my deathbed and I was dying and I went up to you and said, if there's any way when I'm gone, would you please just remember me? Because everybody tends to forget. Everybody forgets. Three generations, you no longer remember who those people are. That's three generations, okay? Once they're gone, you don't even, ah, nobody cares, got my own life going. But if I told you, whenever you do that, can you just think of me? I did everything I could for you. Now listen the way that it really was. I, if I was God, I would say, I, I'm going to save your husband. I'm going to bless your children. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make sure that your road is good. I will always protect you. I will always be right there for you. The only thing that I ask is when these provisions are given to you, would you please just remember what I did to make that possible. And you would go, of course. And that's what Jesus is doing. You do this in remembrance of me. Praise the Lord. Gentlemen, come on up. As they're serving you, I am going to Read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Thank you, Joe. Uh, um, Darren, can you take that side over there? And then uh, AJ's watching the, the guys here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the same night that Judas was betraying the Lord. He didn't have to say all of these really cool things. He didn't have to. He could have rebuked Judas harshly. Instead, just go do what you got to do. And he went and hung himself at the very end. But he said, for I have received of the Lord that which also I depart, I, excuse me, I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. We know that the bread, symbolic, of the body of Christ. 
And we know that his body was literally ripped from him. But you know what? Being shot six times, I can tell you that that's not what hurt him the worst. I understand that he was in torment by all of it. No, the worst pain that there was. But understand there were roads, literally roads filled with them in the time when Nero went bad. The thing that he really bore that was so painful was all of your sin. That's where he took your cancer. Ed, that's where he took your cancer. If we could see it today, and he was on that cross, when he said, it is finished, he literally became sin for us in all of our transgressions, in everything, everything that would make us whole. All those possibilities are there when he said, it is is finished i've done everything that i'm going to do we still beg him for stuff today because we don't understand what he did then that's why we're still asking today well lord i just want your holy spirit to be here he's up there going my holy spirit is omnipresent it's everywhere what now what is it that you want well lord i want a healing I already died so you could be healed you see we don't read the other parts of it what does it take? It is, isn't it the prayer of a righteous man? What's wrong sometimes with us? Now, don't misunderstand me. Sin always leads to death. People are going to die. People are going to get sick. God's judgments, they fall on the just and the unjust. But here, he had given thanks, and he broke the bread, and he said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat it. I want you to understand it, folks, and I don't want you to do it thinking that there's any pressure on you to do it. In fact, I would rather you not if that's the case. After the same manner, he took the cup and when he had supped, saying, now this cup, this is a new testament. This is the new covenant in my blood. There is no redemption without the blood of Jesus Christ. None. That's why in a lot of the translations that are out there, that they're trying to really mess with you and deceive you, they try to take the blood of Jesus Christ out of the translations. And without the blood of Jesus Christ, you have no salvation. And do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. The Lord's coming back. And he's going to find out, did you remember what I did for you? Because if you remembered what I did for you, your life would be lived a little different. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily unworthily anoxios means irreverently kind of like doing something in vain you're just doing it it's a religious practice that you have bless me bless me bless me bless me after a while it is a religious practice that's why we do not do it all the time here I don't want people getting sick from something that becomes a religious practice for you. This is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, if you drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, you're going to be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. That hurts. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Examine yourself first. Find out, are you real? Is your heart pure? Blessed is the pure in heart, for he shall see God. 
Remember when he comes quickly, the door is open, and on the other side, here's the voice of the trumpet. If you have a pure heart, then you'll see God. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, because you're not discerning the Lord's body. You're not discerning even what happened. You have doubt in it. You have no faith in it. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. And many, and it uses this word, sleep, which means they died. They died. Because irreverently, you partook of the Lord without even thinking what he did for you. So when we do this this morning, I want everybody to take a couple minutes and I want you just very quiet to be able to pray and then I'm going to lead everybody in this. But I want you to ask the Lord about yourself. Ask the Lord, am I ready, Lord? And if not, Lord, can you make me ready? I want to remember you and everything I do every time I sit down for a meal, every time I do anything, I want to remember you. So we're just going to take this time, a couple minutes, to be very still and very quiet as you pray. Father, I want to thank you for the body that was broken for us. Thank you, Lord God, for this bread that I'm holding right now, Lord God, the matzah. I ask right now, Lord, that we would remember you as we eat this. Some people think it sounds morbid. I mean, why in the world would we want to eat of these particular things? The reason for it is because when it comes to the body of Christ, now we are the body of Christ. We partake of one another at the same time but this the only way we can do that is to remember what Christ did for us your body I'm, I'm sorry Lord I am so sorry for my part my sin as far as I'm concerned my sin was you killed it on that cross I make some awful mistakes Lord but I can still get on my knees and I know that I can again, being that you are the one making intercession for me, I can ask you, Lord, forgive me. And you told me it's finished, Tim. It was done. Thank you. So Father, as we all eat of this, may we never forget what you did and how you did it. You went through the trial. You went through the test. They tried you all the way to the last bit of flesh that was on your body. And you never sinned. You never sinned. But instead, you became sin, having all of the sin of the world on you. And then you killed it on the cross. So thank you. And we eat this bread in remembrance Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Amen. Lord, thank you for being our high priest. Lord, I don't know what we would do without our high priest to go to and say, Lord, bless me, please. And have you say, you know what? 
after you've eaten of the bread and you've drank of that cup. And whatever you do, you do it in remembrance of me. And by doing that, you bless me. Lord, I want to hear when I get there that I bless you. I know that you blessed me. I know that you died for me. I know that you did all that. But now I stand here, Lord God, asking you, please, be blessed by something that we do. We want to do this for you. We want to remember you. Every bit of your blood was spilled. It was gone. Once he, he thrust that spear in your side, blood and water flowed. So, Lord, right now we're going to drink of this cup, the blood of Jesus Christ. We are going to do this, giving you all thanks and all glory, for without the blood there is no remission of sin. And so by the blood, I pray that this will get into our veins now. And I pray, Lord God, that our heart would reach out to other people and touch other people. So bless us all, Lord God, right now, as we have examined our hearts, and we ask you, Lord God, to give us the mind to always remember what you have done for us and the heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you do me a favor and pass these cups to the aisle, the men will pick it up. Pass it to one end of the aisle, and the men will pick them up. I want everybody to go. This is Thanksgiving week. If you would do me a favor, call somebody this week that you may be having problems with. Make all relationships this week, make them right. Call your mom, call your dad, call your brother, your sister, your uncle. Surprise them and make a relationship right. The Lord bless you and keep you. We will see you next week as we go over a very important church of Laodicea. God bless you.